Dr. Roz, please welcome. So uh, my talk today is based on my recent book, uh, Vast Expanses, A History of the Oceans. Um, uh, but what I'm going to do in the talk itself is to kind of give you a micro uh, episode that I cover briefly in the book and kind of take a deep dive, if you will. I'm going to be looking, showing you a, a painting that was painted in the mid-19th century of an imagined view of the undersea and uh, kind of taking you through a detective investigation of where the ideas for showing such a uh, scene might have come from and what knowledge people had of the undersea um, and, and kind of investigating this one episode of deep sea history. Uh, but I thought I would take a minute to tell you a little bit more about the, the entire book. Um, it is a book that begins with evolutionary and geological time. Uh, the second chapter, Imagined Oceans, takes the reader on a kind of around the world tour uh, of investigating uh, a dozen or so cultures that had particularly interesting relationships with the ocean um, from deep time to about 1500, um, and especially looks at cultures that had interesting relationships with the undersea. Uh, the third chapter looks at the so-called age of discovery when uh, European navigators in particular figured out that all of the world's oceans connected. Uh, the fourth chapter is uh, an episode and will be sort of the focus of, of the talk I'm giving today uh, about the cultural and scientific discovery of the deep oceans in the mid 19th century. Uh, the fifth and the sixth chapters kind of talk about what happened in the post-World War II period uh, imagine, um, Industrial Ocean talks about what happened with traditional uses of the ocean like shipping uh, and fishing that became much more intense and industrialized after World War II. And uh, what happens in chapter six is more a story of, uh, in a way, what didn't happen. It was kind of these uh, ideas for using the undersea, uh, including living undersea that, that have maybe not quite come to pass. And then chapter seven really talks about what happened in the wake of scuba and the uh, accessibility of the ocean to ordinary people and how that has kind of belatedly after the terrestrial environmental movement um, finally brought us to a kind of environmental interest and concern for the ocean. And in general, what I'm trying to do in this book is to push back against the terrestrial bias of history. A lot of history, really pays almost no attention at all to the oceans. And what I'm trying to do in this book is to point out that we really need for a lot of reasons that I try to lay out in this book, but I think reasons that an institute like uh, the Black Island Maritime Institute is, is totally dedicated to, we need to pay attention to uh, the history of the ocean and the history of the human relationship with the ocean because of the reason, the, because the ocean is so important to us today and will be so important to us in the um, very near term future, uh, given the way the world is going with sea level rise and ocean acidification and overfishing and, and so many other things. So that's why I wrote the book. Um, today, I want to spend a little time with you looking at this very intriguing painting, which I have to say, since George mentioned that I didn't spend much time around the actual ocean as a child. This painting now sits in the Indianapolis Art Museum, which I'm fascinated by, and I haven't quite figured out why. Uh, and I went to see it um, during COVID when I drove my daughter to college in the Twin Cities. I came back and, and saw this painting uh, in Indianapolis. So uh, that is one of its many puzzles. There are many. I would like still to learn much more about this painting. Uh, but I want to do some detective work um, in this painting to, to, uh, to think of, to sort of try to understand where it came from. Uh, so this is Edward Moran's 1862 painting, uh, oil painting called Valley in the Sea. And it depicts the underwater realm um, of, it's supposedly the Atlantic Ocean Basin. It's an imagined, obviously, an imagined view. 
And it is uh, painted in the style of the Hudson River School um, style of painting, if, if uh, many people are aware of that. Um, it is uh, perhaps the first um, fine arts representation of the deep ocean, but I will show you. Uh, great question. It's kind of, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty big. And, and I'll show you a few other Hudson River School paintings. To, these tend to be pretty panoramic views. Good, great question. Um, so this is uh, probably the first fine arts representation of the deep ocean, but it is not the first representation at all of the deep ocean. Uh, and that's one of the things I wanna, wanna show you uh, a little bit tonight. All right, so uh, here's the overview of my talk in case you want to like plan to see when you're going to get up and get another beer or take a nap or something. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the Hudson River School. Uh, um, and then I'm going to tell you about five different 19th century contexts that I think have informed this painting and shaped it and kind of influenced why it was made in the first place and all of that. And so the, the five are. Um, natural history, and more specifically, marine zoology, which became very, very popular in the mid-19th century. Uh, the second context is um, the laying of the first transatlantic telegraph cable uh, across the Atlantic Ocean, which brought a lot of attention to the deep sea floor, geopolitical attention and cultural attention. Uh, the third is the possibility that um, new uh, and uh, and renewed interest in diving technologies and undersea technologies might have helped people start thinking about viewing the ocean from the undersea. Uh, the, the fourth is maybe um, the, the most surprising if you don't know much about the 19th century, but the possibility that uh, the very domestic context in which a lot of attention to the deep ocean took place in people's homes um, in, in, in very domestic settings in people's uh, parlors uh, might have made people think about the ocean in a, in a different way, in a more pastoral way. And I'll talk a bit more about that as we go along. And then finally, um, the heightened interest in um, an observation of uh, and, and belief in the realistic possibility of sea serpents in the 19th century based on paleontological discoveries. So we'll, we'll talk about that. So that's where we're going. All right, so what about the Hudson River School? The Hudson River School was known for sweeping landscape paintings. Um, the underwater perspective uh, it, of, of Moran's painting is utterly unique. But if you sort of remove the water, uh, it is <laughs> otherwise in scale and in many other painterly ways uh, a typical painting. So here's a typical example of a Hudson River School painting um, by Thomas Cole. It's The Course of Empire, The Savage State. It's one of a series of four uh, paintings that Thomas Cole made. And um, this painting reflects a kind of romantic reaction against enlightenment, uh, order, and rationality, uh, and control. So here you see um, uh, human figures, but they're very tiny. You see uh, very, it's quite characteristic to have the kind of uh, uh, light and dark um, contrast be very stark. Uh, you see movement created by the, the way the clouds are painted and the way there's kind of a, um, a circular framing and you see an incredibly vast scale. All of these things are very typical of Hudson River School paintings. The artist of Valley in the Sea, Edward Moran, had a brother who was also an artist, Thomas Moran, who was probably more famous than Edward. Uh, this is an example of Thomas Moran's work, and it is called Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone. Uh, and you can see from this painting uh, that he and other Hudson River School painters very often painted the American West um, and uh, painted these kind of grand vistas to show the landscape of the American West. Um, and they did this to um, convey national pride. So the, the kind of idea behind a painting like this was the idea that, okay, Europe has old buildings and old culture 
um, and lots of civilization, but the new world has this spectacular landscape. It was a way to express national pride and to find something about the new world uh, that seemed different from, but as impressive as the old world. So Edward was um, unequaled as a marine painter. He was uh, less often painting in the kind of Hudson River style and more often painting works like this. He was influenced by the British, the very famous British painter, J.M.W. Turner. He was influenced by 17th and 18th century Dutch seascape paintings. Um, he became known for these kind of dramatic green blues, uh, brilliant skies, very detailed, accurate representations of, of the vessels he painted. Um, and so this is a, a, a more typical example of the kind of painting Edward Moran usually did and a picture of him sitting in front of another canvas. Um, this painting, A Clipper at Sunset, was done in 1877. So the first influence on Edward Moran's painting that I want to explore is natural history, and more specifically, the popularity of marine zoology uh, and to some extent marine botany in the mid 19th century. So um, clearly, Valley in the Sea is not actually a scientific illustration, and I'll show you some scientific illustrations so you'll see that it's not meant to be a scientific illustration. But I think you can also see that there are recognizable um, forms of life that are painted there that are fairly naturalistic. So I'm going to sort of try to show you that I think that comes from this tradition of marine natural history, um, marine zoology, marine botany. Moran's painting, uh, art historians believe, was commissioned by its first owner, uh, who was a man named James M. Somerville. He was a Philadelphia physician, himself an amateur artist, uh, and also a naturalist dredger. So he was interested in marine zoology, and he went out and collected specimens by dredging them up from the seafloor. Um, Somerville helped create this painting, and two other artists helped him with it, one of whom was uh, the first professor of drawing and painting of the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts. So he had some help making this, this particular work. This image depicts a colorful underwater scene uh, crowded with many, many species, not in a way that you would actually see them. It's not a landscape in that sense. Uh, it was made for lithographic reproduction in um, a pamphlet that Somerville authored called Ocean Life, and I have the title page here, which was published in 1859, so three years before Moran's painting was, was painted. Um, and what the lithograph is for is to illustrate in color the species that are described in the pamphlet. So this really is scientific illustration of marine animals. So Somerville got specimens to study um, using a natural history dredge and a set of natural history practices that were developed by a community of dredgers, of zoologists in Britain first, and then uh, the practice transferred over to the United States. Marine natural history was a serious pursuit um, by gentlemen amateurs, including people like Charles Dar Darwin, um, who created the theory of uh, evolution by natural selection. He was a, he learned how to dredge in um, Edinburgh when he was a student. And so here you see the rowboat. The guy with the top hat is the scientist. The other guys are the, the, the boat and the watermen he hired. Uh, and, and a naturalist might or might not have much uh, experience with dredging. Uh, they might be relying more on the skill of the watermen. They might have some of their own experience. It depended on the person. And um, the shift from uh, the dredge on the left, which was modeled after an oyster, kind of a common oyster dredge, to the dredge on the right, which is the scientific tool uh, of a scientific dredge, um, was uh, affected for a couple of reasons. One, it was easier to use the, the dredge that's rectangular instead of square. And the other reason is because uh, you could um, get rid of the net 
and everything else folded down and fit in the bottom of a carpet bag so you could carry it with you when you went on holidays and went dredging, which is important if you're a naturalist dredger. Uh, and then you had to hire people who had a boat like that and that's and make it all work. Um, and that sounds silly, but it is really part of the natural history practice was to know sort of how to do those things and how to make those connections to get to get your collecting done. Oh, and I forgot to say, no, that was the next one. Um, so the foremost early naturalist dredger was Edward Forbes, who grew up in the Isle of Man and had himself, he was one of those people who had a lot of boat, small boat experience. Um, and he was uh, very much responsible for creating marine zoology as uh, a field of science, uh, published a book called The Natural History of the European Seas. It was actually published posthumously uh, in 1859. He died in 1854, and he drew this cartoon. This cartoon was a frontispiece. So it was drawn before 1854 because that's when he died. And you see the little boat, just like the other picture I showed you, right? But he's imagining what's happening underwater. And one of the, the reasons I'm sort of dwelling on this is that somebody like Somerville, whose, whose pamphlet Ocean Life was published the same year as Forbes' posthumous publication, would have learned about dredging through the community of people that uh, Edward Forbes uh, formed and, and got going. So he would have been aware of Edward Forbes' work, if not exactly this cartoon. All right, so I've been talking about uh, 1859, the year that both Somerville and Forbes books were published, pamphlet and book were published. I'm gonna go back two decades to 1830 to show you this picture because it is both part of the natural history tradition and it is also um, the first aquarium view that we know of. So we all know what an aquarium view is. We, we see aquariums out there, right? Um, aquarium views are so common today, but aquariums were not invented until 1850. So this view where you can see the undersea and a little bit of the surface there is, is a kind of startling um, thing to look at. It's a puzzle. We know the, the historian who's written most about the person who drew this uh, cartoon doesn't really know where he came up with the idea for showing an aquarium view. So this was created by Henry de la Beche, who was a uh, British geologist. And it is a scene uh, whose title is Durier Antiquior, which translated from Latin means a more ancient Dorset. So he's showing fossils come to life in Dorset, where uh, Mary Anning did a lot of fossil collecting. Uh, and there's a recent movie out about her. I'm forgetting what the movie's called. Anyway, so, uh, so uh, uh, but uh, Henry de la Beche made this picture in 1830 and, and the puzzle remains, did he maybe uh, think about this kind of a view because he had some experience with diving technology? We just don't know what made him uh, think of making a view like Aquariums, actual aquariums, were invented and popularized in the 1850s uh, and became, in fact, a Victorian craze, uh, in, first in Britain and about a decade later in the United States. And they offered and made familiar this aquarium view that were, that's so sort of obvious to us today. So there had been a practice of keeping goldfish in bowls that was quite ancient, dating back to ancient uh, China and Japan. Um, and people had tried over the years to keep marine creatures alive in various kinds of containers on land, but it was not until an article in 1850 written by a guy named Robert Warrington uh, reporting on an experiment keeping uh, marine plants and animals together in, in, a, in a glass container uh, that, that sort of set off this aquarium craze. And the person who popularized aquariums was a man named Philip Henry Goss. He was a teacher, a writer, an amateur naturalist. He published a very, very popular book on marine zoology uh, in 1853. And then the following year published this book 
called the Aquarium in 1854. And in 1854, that exact same year, um, Britain repealed a very uh, heavy glass tax. And suddenly, aquariums became accessible to ordinary consumers in ways that they had not been before. So there were a lot of things sort of coming together to make the aquarium craze happen. Uh, people who kept aquariums in their homes could either go to the shore and collect specimens from themselves. They could go, if they lived in London, to shops and buy specimens. And there was also a catalog uh, ordering possible of specimens to be sent to your house. So this really was kind of a well-established business in the mid-19th century. And um, people in the mid-19th century viewed marine zoology as a very appropriate activity for respectable middle-class families and upper-class families too, including women, including children. Um, and there were women who engaged in very serious pursuit of amateur natural history. And remember, they were almost all amateurs doing science at this time. Charles Darwin was an amateur. Uh, so there were lots of um, women who became, there was a famous woman named Margaret Gaddy who became a seaweed expert. Uh, marine zoology was uh, a, a subfield like botany that was considered especially appropriate for women. Unlike, for example, ornithology, um, or, uh, where you'd have to shoot the birds, that was not so considered so appropriate for women. All right, so many families bought and read Goss's books and brought aquariums into their homes um, and enjoyed them. Uh, in Britain, the home aquarium craze waned after 1860, uh, but large public aquariums started becoming popular at that point uh, in, in across Europe and in the United States. Uh, this is a picture of the Boston Aquarial Gardens. And you can see early on in the 1860s, it's still small individual aquariums and later they get bigger. So wrapping up this natural history thread, marine zoology produced the practice of scientifically accurate representation of marine life and seafloor features, um, often presented as a kind of a, um, aquarium view or a kind of undersea landscape view. Um, and uh, here I'm just showing you a, a picture of kind of where this tradition went. This is a picture from 1876, uh, and it is, so it couldn't have influenced Moran directly, but it, sh it sort of gives you that sense of um, scientists showing uh, typical organisms in a kind of aquarium and, and landscape view. All right, so Moran's painting seems to have been influenced by traditions and representational practices associated with marine zoology, with mid 19th century natural history. And I think this is especially uh, likely to be the case given that the person who we believe uh, commissioned the painting was himself uh, an, an amateur uh, marine zoology student and author. But natural history may not have been the only inspiration, and in fact, probably was not the only inspiration. Uh, this is not exactly a scientific representation. And art historians believe that Moran uh, may have been inspired to create the scene um, in part because of uh, studies that were done in the 18, investigations that were done in the 1850s that, were, that led to the laying of the first transatlantic telegraph cable. So the first attempt to lay a telegraph cable across the Atlantic happened in 1857 and that one failed. In the following year, in 1858, a cable was successfully laid across the entire Atlantic Ocean. It worked briefly, long enough for, um, uh, for President uh, James Buchanan and Queen Victoria to send cele celebratory messages back and forth and for there to be lots of fanfare and congratulations uh, in, in newspapers and things like that. And once the cable failed, uh, there was a, a big investigation about what made the cable fail, and it was determined that electrical issues made the cable fail. And from that point on, uh, everybody associated with the cable laying endeavor believed that the ocean had been conquered and the ocean was no longer the problem. It was just figuring out the electrical engineering. 
So the 1857 and 58 cabling attempts are very important uh, in terms of people feeling like uh, we had, we, you know, they had begun to, to be able to control and, and operate in the ocean. All right. An important precursor to cable laying involved learning about the deep sea floor. Um, before the American Lieutenant Matthew Fontaine Maury began a program of deep sea soundings in the 1840s, navigators were essentially not interested in knowing how deep the ocean was if it was 200 fathoms or more. So a fathom is six feet, which is the wingspan of an adult male. And uh, the reason why depths were measured in fathoms is because you could very quickly grab one piece, sort of bite of line after another and measure the depth in kind of normal de navigational depths. Uh, uh, navigators who went offshore carried sounding lines that were 200 fathoms long because if it was deeper than 200 fathoms, you were off the continental shelf and nobody cared how deep it was. You were safe. Uh, in other words, navigators didn't care how deep the ocean was, they cared how shallow the ocean was. But Maury started doing a series of deep sea soundings in part for navigational reasons because he wanted to try to find, to go to places where there were, were reported shallow areas and either fix the reef or rock exactly or more likely disprove it, prove that it didn't exist and there was no hazard to navigation and erase it from the chart. And this would make uh, shipping go faster. Uh, so that's what he was really after. Maury was also uh, interested intellectually in the work of Alexander von Humboldt's physical geography. And um, you can see the title of the book that he published um, was in 1855 is The Physical Geography of the Sea, which is an effort to uh, think about the ocean the way Alexander von Humboldt was uh, asking people to think in general about uh, um, geography and physical geography. So this is the first, the second bathymetric chart that was ever made of the entire Atlantic Ocean, uh, made by Maury. It was in 1855. And um, it, it depicts his idea and other, the idea that was emerging from these deep sea soundings of what the ocean looked like. That uh, the ocean floor kind of went pretty rapidly and evenly down to a, the depth that it, the, the lowest depth that it was, and then it was a pretty flat basin. And that is the image that Moran is painting in his painting. It's a flat ocean. There's no mid-Atlantic ridge in this story. <laughs> um, so, so it's kind of, it's this idea that the, earth, the oceans would be as deep as the highest land was tall, and that the ocean basin would be this very regular bowl. Uh, so that was the, uh, the theoretical idea that, that um, Maury and other people had at this time. And I want to pause to note uh, that it, an important context for ocean uh, investigation at, in the mid-19th century was imperialism, like many 19th century scientists and hydrographers know. Um, Maury pursued scientific investigations uh, to support American expansion. Uh, the British were also very uh, active in deep sea investigations to support their imperial uses of the ocean. Uh, Maury was interested uh, in pursuing maritime commerce dedicated to uh, not only supporting American expansion generally, uh, but to um, extending the institution of racial slavery from the U.S. South to other parts of the world, places like Brazil and Mexico. Um, particularly in the wake of the racial reckoning of the summer of 2020, when many Confederate statues were taken down. And indeed, uh, the statue over there uh, on your right of Matthew Fontaine Maury was targeted um, and, uh, by protesters and eventually was taken down. It's, I think it's really important to pause and recognize uh, that uh, although Maury is also someone who is very important in the history of science, uh, and, and needs to be recognized for that. He was someone who was also virulently racist, and we need to recognize those two things side by side. So Maury was contacted by the American entrepreneur Cyrus Field, who asked whether 
uh, cables could be laid safely in the ocean steps. Based on these 1840s investigations that Maury had been engaged in, he replied affirmative, affirmatively and sort of explained to Cyrus Field, the main entrepreneur for the submarine cable laying, uh, what he thought in terms of the bottom contours and also um, studies of bottom sediments that were done by microscopists. Uh, they, were, they believed that the ocean floor was a very calm place with no currents at all. And the only thing down there were diatoms and radiolarians uh, and other small uh, things like that. There was some debate over whether those things were alive at depth or not alive at depth. But regardless, uh, everyone agreed that this was going to be a very safe environment to put uh, cables and cables would be able to be installed there and operate effectively there. Um, there was a general sense uh, that there was no life below about 300 fathoms. Uh, that understanding changed uh, rather rapidly after the Moran painting was, was done for reasons that I could talk about. But, but at this very moment, uh, there was a sense that there was just not much, of, not much to endanger a cable uh, at the bottom of the ocean. Um, so this image is not from the 1857 and 58 cable laying attempts. It's from the successful attempt in 1866, so 10 years later. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm showing it to you. I'll tell you why I'm showing it to you, but it's not something that Moran would have seen. Um, but this is an allegorical image celebrating the success of laying the cable across the Atlantic. Uh, you see in the undersea, Neptune welcoming the cable into his realm. You see the Great Eastern, the big boat in the middle, which was the boat that uh, held, was the only boat big enough to hold all the cable, to lay uh, the cable. And all kinds of other boats busily prosecuting co commerce, uh, the lion, Britain, the eagle, the United States. This is a geopolitical image. Uh, this is an image that um, is, is rep kind of reflecting and representing na the national pride of Britain and the United States being the countries who were able to lay this cable uh, and, and unite these, these two continents. Uh, there's a lot of uh, technological celebration, a lot of national pride in this image. And that, that's what I want you to sort of keep in mind. The 1866 cable also produced this image, with, which I think is really incredibly arresting. Um, it's titled, captioned, Diver in Search of the Atlantic Cable Gets into Hot Water. And if you can see it well enough, you see all kinds of, um, you know, sharks and fish and mer people and, and kind of scary things kind of crowding out and surrounding and maybe threatening the helmeted diver. Um, so, uh, and that's sort of a, a segue for, for what's gonna come next. So that cartoon, along with maybe the De La Beche image of the aquarium view, um, reminds us that diving, although it was not much used by kind of naturalists in the mid, early to mid 19th century, uh, did uh, develop and began to be used increasingly in the second half of the 19th century for underwater construction, um, and, and other uh, salvage, uh, especially those two things, transforming from the diving bell to the helmeted diver. Um, and, uh, but we do have one uh, example of, of a naturalist who, who embraced this diving technology as a way to learn about the deep ocean and represent it. So a popular book about the ocean published in the 1830s is sort of typical of what I think of as the before situation. You have this, the only representation in this whole book, um, the ocean, wonders and important products of the sea, that represents the undersea is the picture of the diving bell itself. When you look at the pictures of the marine mammals, for example, even the great whale, somehow the great whale is levitated on top of the ocean so you can see it. There's no, there's no imagination that one could view a whale from underneath in this book. And, and yet that was soon to change. So in the right hands and, and minds, a few decades later, um, 
you had the example of uh, Eugene von Ransonet, who was uh, born in Vienna and became an artist, but he was also a diplomat. Uh, and he was also in his spare time, he must have had more spare time than I have, a painter, a lithographer, a naturalist, an explorer. He was a busy guy. Um, and he was very enthusiastic, but, uh, enthusiastic about color lithography. So from 1860, he began traveling in Palestine and Egypt and India and Japan. Um, and uh, he developed an interest in the undersea and he built his own diving bell, which is shown in a popular science, uh, reproduced in a popular science uh, magazine here. Um, uh, so that he himself could go underwater and make sketches and notes about colors and things like that. So that when he got back on shore, he could paint undersea scenes. Um, so the bell had uh, an air supply that came from a boat. You can sort of see that hose. It had cannonballs that weighted it down. It had a little seat because, you know, he had to be comfortable while he was sketching. It had a porthole so he could see out. Um, and, uh, and this is uh, an example of a lithograph that was made from one of his paintings. And uh, this is another lithograph made from another painting. And there's a reproduction of his, his uh, diving bell. Rantanay used this diving bell in relatively shallow water. Uh, during his, his travels, he often sketched landscapes and created lithographs also for other, other authors. Uh, so he didn't only do this, he, he did the art for himself, but he, he was a lithographer for other people. Um, these two lithographs were painted uh, probably in 1864 and 65, so just after Moran did his painting. The futurist Arthur C. Clarke uh, believed that these were the first paintings to be ever made underwater, and he believed that because Rancinet said that, um, but it seems likely to be true. Um, and, uh, but so, so these are a kind of an interesting example of something that was happening at about the same time Iran was working and a kind of suggestion that the idea of diving technology as it might have influenced De La Beche, uh, you know, maybe also had something to do with Moran being able to envision this undersea scene. All right, so this image could be a celebration of the landscape of the seafloor. Um, holding submarine telegraph wires. It could be the, a geopolitical and nationalist kind of image. That's what I'm trying to suggest based on this analysis. It could be celebratory of human control of the natural world. Uh, but there are other contexts that may suggest different or additional interpretations uh, for, for Moran's painting. The discovery of the depths took place uh, not only by natural history dredgers, submarine telegraph entrepreneurs and, and people involved in cable laying, naval hydrographers and people like that. It also took place in the home um, and in the context of families. So uh, marine zoology depended on cultural changes that transformed the beach from a fringe area populated by cannibals and mutineers and shipwreck victims uh, to a socially desirable location, a place that people sought out for reasons of health, um, morally appropriate entertainment, and novel bodily sensations. It's essentially the reason why Block Island is inundated every summer by tourists, right? It starts uh, in, in the mid-19th century. And discovery of the beach lay the cultural foundation um, for an appreciation of the ocean steps in the mid-19th century. So, so the emergence, all right. So I wanna talk about these two images before I go on. This is a picture of Brighton Beach in the 1880s. So a little later than I'm talking about, but you see, you know, this place is chock full of people enjoying the sun and the waves and the surf. My real favorite picture, well, I have two favorite pictures. The other one is the next picture. Uh, this is a, a cartoon from 1857, the in the same Harper's Weekly magazine that the, success, the temporarily successful laying of the first submarine telegraph cable was uh, reported. And it is called, the, the, I don't know if you can't read the caption, 
curious objects often seen at the seashore at low water. So it's, it's, it's lighthearted, um, but it really shows you what people did at the beach in the mid 19th century. That's what they did. They studied things that they found on the beach. Um, and so uh, that's one of my favorite pictures. This is my other favorite picture. So, uh, and this picture shows you the extent to which much discovery of the sea took place in the home, in drawing rooms and parlors, uh, where men and women and children tended aquariums and read books uh, and undertook various other activities that directed their attention imaginatively to the undersea world. So this image was published in Punch in 1857, and it is captioned, terrific accident, bursting of old Mrs. Twaddle's aqua vivarium. The old lady may be in, uh, observed endeavoring to pick up her favorite eel with tongs, a work requiring some address. So every bit of that caption is fascinating to me, right? She has the favorite eel, really? <laughs> um, but you see in this picture, the young ladies, uh, the younger boy off in the corner, old Mrs. Twaddle, uh, it, and that you see the setting in which this interest in the ocean is taking place. And just fix that in your mind. This is happening in these very domestic spaces. And here are some more pictures to show you that this interest in the ocean was happening otherwise in domestic spaces, even if you didn't have an aquarium. So, um, uh, back when people made their own music instead of listening to the radio, uh, sheet music was a big thing. And there are examples of uh, sheet music dedicated to the Ocean Telegraph March, the Atlantic Telegraph Polka, uh, ce celebrating the, the, the um, uh, submarine cable. Uh, one of my favorites is 100, 100 Fathoms Deep. I would love to find someone who could just play this music for me. Uh, but you see this very domestic scene with Neptune and a mer mommy with a baby. You know, so you have these images of the undersea. You also have uh, the craze of dressing kids in sailor suits that, and, and women too, began in the uh, mid to late 19th century. Um, and the actual uh, cable that was laid in 1858, um, the successful cable was the, the remaining cable that wasn't used was chopped up by Tiffany and companies into little bits and sold as souvenirs. And people made um, watch fobs out of bits of cable and tops of canes uh, and other, and what else? Um, uh, oh, umbrella handles. So, so these things were, were, were sort of circulating in, in the world. I also found an advertisement for ocean spray perfume created in honor of the successful laying of the cable. So this, this stuff was just in, in the, in, in the water, or whatever, in the air. All right. So popular reading included stories that focused on the undersea. Um, the left is a frontispiece from Jules Verne, the French version of Jules Verne's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, uh, published in 1870. Um, Jules Verne wrote this book after visiting an aquarium, after taking trip across the Atlantic on the Great Eastern right after it had laid the telegraph cable. He um, interviewed Cyrus Field and other people involved in the telegraph cable laying endeavor. And he wrote the book with Matthew Fontaine Maury's book, Physical Geography of the Sea, open up on his desk next to him. He also wrote it on a yacht. I mean, this, this, this one book is kind of the encapsulation of all this kind of fascination for the deep ocean that was happening in the mid 19th century. Um, uh, another, uh, the painting on the right is from Victor Hugo's The Toilers. And he also read Matthew Fontaine Maury's work and was very influenced by it, as well as the work of a French um, marine scientist named uh, Jules uh, Michelet, who wrote a book in 1861. Uh, so these two books came after Morin's painting, but they're part of this mid century fascination and imaginative fascination with the undersea. In considering the domestic setting for much encounter with the undersea, perhaps then we can look at this and see this pastoral element, which was part of some Hudson River paintings, calm, civilized, could be that's what's going on here. 
But on the other hand, remember I talked about the contrast of dark and light in a lot of these paintings? You have these kind of dark edges and these dark spaces in the painting. Um, and what's that all about? Could that be related to something a little more threatening, a little more um, mysterious? So this is a painting made by Eugene Ransonet, uh in around 1867. The others were lithographs. This is a painting uh, that wasn't made into lithograph. And if you see over there on your right and the bottom, there's something that looks like a human skull, right? All right. So the skull and the dark elements of uh, Moran's paintings may reflect another thread of 19th century thinking about the ocean, especially its depths. Um, a French language edition of Hugo's Toilers of the Sea, published in 1866, was made with illustrations by the famous artist Gustave Doré, uh, who uh, made his, uh, uh, achieved fame by illustrating uh, Byron's poems and went on to illustrate uh, a, a very famous edition of Coleridge's Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, um, uh, which was published in 1870. So in these images, especially if you look at the one on the right, which is Gustave Doré's illustration of the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, um, you see the ocean as a place full of malevolent creatures. And it's just kind of teeming with them. More of the Doré illustrations, the one on the left, shows an underwater view in which you have wrecks and dead men and, and creeping animals and this kind of supernatural element. Um, and, and so where do these menacing views of the ocean, where did this kind of mystery view of the ocean come from, or how did it sort of exist simultaneously with this kind of pastoral domestic view I just showed you? There was a long tradition of sightings of sea monsters and sea serpents, uh, but there was a, a really tremendous spike of sightings of sea serpents in the early 19th century. Um, a particularly exhibitionist sea serpent was seen many, many, many times off Gloucester, Massachusetts in 1817 and 1819 on one occasion witnessed by 300 people at the same time. So this is 300 people who all agreed that they saw a sea serpent and attested to it to, in, in, to judges and, and, and in depositions. Um, the picture over uh, on your right is a representation of um, the officers and the captain of the HMS Daedalus, who in 1848 reported watching that creature cavort around the ocean for 20 minutes. These are experienced people who are experienced at seeing things at sea, and they were seeing things like this. There were there was this kind of spike of, of accounts of seeing things that look like sea serpents in the first half of the 19th century. One reason why sea monsters and sea serpents were taken seriously, other than the fact that they were being seen by reliable observers, uh, was that there was new fossil evidence of large extinct marine creatures. In 1845, New York City residents could visit uh, this 140 foot skeleton of a sea serpent that was discovered and assembled by Albert Koch, who was a German immigrant and showman uh, and scientific collector, perhaps a little more on the Barnum side than the scientific side. Um, he had previously toured American cities with the skeleton of a mastodon, so he had a kind of a track record for doing this kind of stuff. Um, the public greeted this monster with great enthusiasm, but experts very quickly pointed out that the bones came from six different fossil skeletons and probably didn't exactly look like that. But, uh, but he did eventually sell the skeleton to uh, a German prince. So got his money. But Cox Monster was, um, the fact that it was even briefly considered uh, scientific um, relates to these kind of fossil discoveries that were taking place. This image was created by the uh, illustrator Edouard Roux in 1864 of an ichthyosaur fighting with a plesiosaur. Um, and it appeared in a popular French language publication, but there are many, many, many similar versions of this scene to be found in uh, 19th century scientific um, uh, publications. 
Doré's fantastical works were one source of inspiration for the American artist Elihu Vedder, whose 1864 painting, The Lair of the Sea Serpents, um, was, uh, was the painting that made, made his first public success. It's the thing that made him into a famous painter. He sketched studies of an eel as a model, so the creature looks uh, pretty realistic. And um, this, this kind of what might seem like a serene kind of a painting um, is kind of disturbed if you notice the open eye and the kind of utter stillness of this um, sea monster lying in wait to attack whatever prey comes by. So it's sort of a picture that's meant to evoke the terrifying, mysterious nature of the sea, even though it's a picture that takes place uh, on, on land. So one important context for Moran's work was the resurgence um, of attention to the possibility that the sea might hold in secret large, previously undiscovered uh, things out there like sea serpents or something else large that was yet undiscovered. So this association of mystery um, very much. So I hope that what I have done in taking you on this journey through these five different contexts for this painting is to um, help you see that this painting might contain some or all of uh, the following. Uh, newfound scientific fascination with the sea, especially of marine zoology. Second, the confident nationalism of people who had successfully laid a cable across the entire Atlantic Ocean. Um, three, the possibilities raised by new diving technologies to get a different perspective, a new view of the ocean through the underwater. Um, four, the, uh, the uh, domestic context, the fact that the ocean was being discovered and explored and enjoyed in the home uh, might have added a kind of pastoral element. And fifth, uh, that despite that, there was a lot of mystery and danger still lurking in the way that people were thinking about what might still uh, be in the ocean. So mostly, I would like to invite you to sort of think about and maybe talk about what you see in this painting. Um, and thank you for your attention. And I look forward to talking about this very intriguing detective story about the mid 19th century. Doesn't have to be a question. It could be what you see in the painting. Way in the back. You see mountains. I agree. Way in the back, yeah. And vistas, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, the comment is that there's a lot of green, and you know, is that supposed to be algae, or does that have more to do with uh, terrestrial? I would say terrestrial uh, assumptions about the ocean. I think probably the latter, uh, phytoplankton and plankton was not really the subject of research until um, uh, kind of the last quarter of the 19th century to the, to the turn of the 20th century. So, so I, I mean, of course, people who work on the sea would be aware that the ocean might look green. And he did, Edward Moran did like greens in his, in his marine paintings. Uh, so my, my, Punch is, I would, I mean, I, there's, I'm so excited to know that there's an art historian who's also interested in this painting. So I'm hoping that we all learn more eventually. But my guess would be it has more to do with um, as, uh, aesthetic choices uh, than necessarily scientific knowledge in that, in that particular regard. Question in the, all the way in the back. Well, that's a good question. I think they knew, you know, they definitely knew that closer to shore and that there were places with, with um, uh, um, more complicated topography from that. I mean, Maury's vision of the Atlantic was really the middle of the Atlantic. And in fact, Maury had this um, 
really based, let's just talk about data sets, based on one line of soundings <laughs> um, in which he missed the Mid-Ocean Ridge, he, he decided that there was one place which was an exception to the otherwise rough seafloor, which was exactly where the cable layers wanted to lay the cable because it was the great circle route. So just by coincidence, the place where the 19th century entrepreneurs thought it would be cheapest to lay a cable turned out to be just the right place to lay the cable. So, so there were other parts of the ocean that were thought to be very rough. So I, that's a good question because if this was supposed to be the valley of the sea where the cable was, it is weird to have all that, that sort of, um, I, you know, Edward Moran did not write down anything about this painting, so we sort of don't know much. Um, but it is, yeah, that's, so there were places in the ocean that were understood to be very rough, and maybe he was sort of doing a little bit of both. Yeah, it does look idyllic. I agree. Um, yeah, I, it's absolutely tinged with romanticism, as were all the Hudson River paintings. But what's so intriguing is that this is so subject-wise so different than anything uh, else that the Hudson River paint, painters uh, came up with. Somebody else in the back? Yeah. You know, we also don't know a lot about that either. So if it was commissioned by Somerville, which we think it was, it would have been privately held. Um, and I, I do not know. So when I tried to do research on this, it was during the pandemic. And um, the, uh, uh, I was not allowed access to any of the um, files. The art historian I mentioned got copies of some of the things in the accession file, but still doesn't seem, doesn't seem to have information about how it ended up in Indiana. I mean, it's publicly displayed now. Actually, it's interesting because when I saw it uh, in fall of 2020, it was the last week it was gonna be on display in Indianapolis and it was being sent over for two different um, exhibits in Europe in a row. It's gonna be in Europe for, for quite a while and then will eventually make its way back to the United States. But that's, the, that's one of the questions I would love to know the answer to. Um, great question. I'll file it away for my future research. Ah, I'm sorry, I should have answered that question. Um, so what was the purpose of the cables? It was uh, submarine telegraph messages, and it had um, economic importance, for companies that wanted to be able to um, get information, financial information, this is Wall Street existed and, and stuff by this time. Uh, and also um, reasons to do with national security and international relations. So the idea of being able to communicate across the Atlantic instantaneously uh, for political reasons was considered to be um, very important. And that's why the governments essentially helped subsidize the cable by providing naval vessels and things like that, even though it was otherwise an entrepreneurial endeavor. Thank you for asking that. I should have thought of that. Yes. 